Are you an SRE? A developer? A quality engineer who wants to tackle the challenge of improving reliability in your DevOps? You can enable your DevOps for reliability with Chaos Native. Create your free account at Chaos Native Litmus Cloud. G'day. Welcome to Avoiding Goodhart's Law, using SLOs as tools, not cudgels. Before I start sharing the PowerPoint, let me just cover what we're going to talk about. See, the concepts of SLI and SLO and error budget, they're there to balance risk and reward. Risk around the acceptable rate of change and reward being the business success and customer contentment. Using such metrics to punish teams for exceeding budgets uh, or forcing acceptance of change within the business is a path to failure. And this session is going to give you some hints for success, but first maybe I should introduce myself. I'm Marco Coulter. I am an ex-CTO who has worked for one of the top 50 international banks. I've supported data centers for hospitals and service providers. I've worked for some of the industry's largest vendors. I've lived in three countries and managed teams across 13 countries. I also spent five years as an industry analyst at uh, I ran the data science team organization at 451 Research, which has since been acquired by Standards & Poor. Seeing technology from every side as an operator, a developer, an analyst, a vendor, a buyer, and a CTO gives me a unique view on technology. I can read, or sorry, you can read some of my writing or interviews in the publications on the left here, or on my website, tech-whisperer.com. So enough about me. It's Good to have targets, right? Think of Robin Hood, the story where he places a child against a tree and he loads up an arrow and he aims. Now, with an apple as the target on the child's head, this is the story of a skilled archer. But without a target, without the target apple, it's the story of a crazy guy, dangerous guy, shooting arrows at children. So it's good to have targets as long as you use them correctly. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Today's session comes in three chapters. I will talk about how I experienced Goodhart's Law before I even knew it existed. Then we will think about SLIs in a better way across dimensions. And then finally, I'm going to throw a few hints about negotiating your SLIs and give you some links to further reading. So let's get going. I'll get to Goodhart's Law in a moment, but first I want to share a story of my experience with you. Depending on your personality, you will either relax and enjoy my story, or you might already be searching for Goodhart on Wikipedia. That sort of thing, of searching for the answer first, is that that's gaming the system. And some folks see gaming the system as the smart play. Others equate the phrase to, like, cheating. I'm more in the second group. For me, gaming the system means manipulating the rules meant to protect a system to instead manipulate the system towards a desired outcome. In a prior life, uh, back in Australia, I worked for a service provider that supported all of the hospitals in a state. The, in hospitals, nurses, you know, they take lab samples and the, they get sent to the labs. They are processed and the results get transmitted back to the patient record where the nurses back in the ward can then immediately look them up. Pretty simple, right? By the way, the wards are, you know, they're up on the 16th floor or somewhere high up in the hospital buildings, while the labs are generally in the basement of another building on the campus. So there's some physical distance between the two. Technically, it looked a little like this. The messages from the labs Unix system would be sent into message queues. 
and the queues would be read by the lab update, would you know, fe feed the lab updates into the mainframe system, holding the patient records. Now, everything allegedly spoke a common HL7 standard, so there was never going to be any problems. All different vendors involved. I think you see where this is going. The support of the HL7 standard was not perfect. Malformed messages created by proprietary software along the way would get stuck in the queue. We would then get phone calls from hospitals that they had to go to manual procedures. And the backup procedure, if the, if the patient record's not getting updated, was for the nurse to physically run down from the ward to the labs to get the results and bring it back to the ward. That was not optimal, as the patient's health was at risk both from the delay and from the nurse being absent. To take care of this, we agreed an SLA that if the message queues got higher than 100, the service provider that I worked for had to refund money back. And that should address things, right? You know, looking at the thing that we thought was broken. So I coded a bash monitor script, and so when the queue length approached 100, alerts would go off. Monocor icons would turn from green to yellow to red. As technicians, we were focusing on the measure as the target, the goal. You know, we even built capacity plans around making sure the queue processing got all the power it needed. Now you might think, well, that's great, Marco, top-notch result. Lab results get back to the ward in time, right? The only problem was that we would get these pesky phone calls from nurses in the wards saying the system sucked. They were always having to run down and manually collect results. But the message queues were empty. So the problem was that transactions were often timing out before hitting the message queue. We hadn't seen the whole picture. We were managing the capacity plan, the, in fact, the whole application to the metric, not to the outcome. Now, years later, I learned that this behavior had a name. Yes, finally, we're gonna to get to Goodhart. Goodhart was an economist in the UK. And in 1975, he stated, I'm just gonna read this, any observed Statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purposes. It's kind of wordy. I guess he was English and a politician and wordy is what you get. Anyway, here's what he meant. Basically, Goodhart's law says that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. You see, Q length was a good measure of Q function. We were managing to that as a target for success building capacity plans and so on based on the queue instead of the successful laboratory transactions in patients' records. So how do we avoid Goodhart's law? Well, we needed to let the SLIs be measures and, and then use the SLOs as the goal. So what should we measure? Um, and in, the key is to stand in other people's shoes, see everything from a few different angles. Hence, three dimensions. Remember that SRE is really about balancing the risk of unavailability against rapid innovation and efficient operation. And we embrace that risk by giving it a value through well-defined and governed service level indicators, objectives, and agreements. As you are identifying SLIs, we need measures that see the whole picture in the three key dimensions. So let's step through a simple example of each of these dimensions based on that hospital environment. The examples will not give specific SLIs that you can apply to your environment. It's not meant to. The example is intended to share the thought process. So first, let's quickly review the SLI, SLO, SLA model so that we're talking about the same thing. So SLI, service level indicators, are the numbers and work better when they are percentiles. Avoid averages, you miss things, in mature environments, SLIs will be nested. They will combine from SLIs that sit against the code and the technology up to SLIs that sit next to the customer. They are a defined quantitative measure, a metric. You will then set limits on the SLIs, say an upper band or maybe upper and lower, and that gives us the SLO, service level objective. SLOs should capture the performance and availability levels that if barely met, would keep your typical customer happy. They are generally a target you know, 
failures are less than X or a range, responses will be between X and Y. Generally, I like to translate the SLOs into periodic budgets of you know, between X and Y over this period of time so that I can track weekly. But that weekly timing might depend on your release cycles and so on. Maybe you can expand it to month. Maybe you need it every single day. The SLAs define what actions are acceptable once the budget gets used up. Defining these ahead of time is critical. Oh, and there's one additional thing. Full outages tend to happen less these days, so the focus needs to be on sort of slowdowns as well. So rather than traditional uptime availability, I try to focus on the customer domain and their experience and then use successful customer requests as a, as a, sort of a general goal instead. Now, to capture the overall environment, those nested SLIs supporting the customer experience, the, supporting the CX ones, should cover each of the three dimensions. So first, let's start with the code. Now, from our code, we want functional code that does not fail and additional features and write-downs of technical debt. So you'll be dealing along the way with multiple languages. So you want to make sure that the metrics will work across them generically where you can avoid metrics that would only apply to a specific coding language. It's too much extra handling. You're creating work for yourself. I guess you're creating tech debt in a sense, even in the, in the measure. Also, it will not be limited to applications you built in-house. So sometimes you're gonna to have to deal with third-party applications like SAP and the ABAP language or, or SaaS applications like Salesforce. And maybe what you're managing is environmental like Kubernetes, you know, or your, your reaction times in PagerDuty or something. And then you're not just watching the code transaction er errors, you are looking at the configurations and looking for configurations errors again. So some of these nested SLIs there around the code might indicate a YAML, YAML code accuracy or something like that if you're running a Kubernetes environment. You want to avoid silos of data here. You don't want the SRE team working off one source of metrics while the development team works off another. You, you need a single source of SLI truth as part of deciding what you will base the SLOs on. So for the sample indicator you know, in the healthcare, Let's embed a few clarifications. Our first step would be to focus on well-formed updates. That specifies the transaction that we're looking at. We want to update the patient record and acknowledge completion successfully. That acknowledge of completion specifies the reaction. And in this case, we agreed to using an APM tool, an application performance monitoring, as the tool. And that specifies the source right, of the data, the, that, common, that single place of truth. Uh, now, you know, I'm familiar with AppDynamics for ABM, but you could be just as easily, excuse me, use Datadog or New Relic. In fact, as we are only concerned about code here, you might prefer observability offerings like Honeycomb or Instana. Um, you know, this observability segment, I, I don't know, you know, IBM acquired Instana, observability is getting very interesting right now. Now, some SRE books recommend good over bad ratios for SLIs. If you control all the code, that can work. But in this example, I'm avoiding the fail ratio as there were too many elements out of our control. The HL7 update transactions were coming out of purchase proprietary software running on the lab's hardware. We had no way of fixing that code. We, we had to wait for patches to come in. Um, so we were not gonna be held accountable for those failures. Also the queuing systems were third party software, different vendor, so we couldn't tweak them to respond better to malformed entries to not you know, get stuck. Um, and we could not be certain that we would reach a point where the HL7 outputs were always well formed. So that the basic code SLI would need to be focused on well formed updates getting to the code that we were writing and controlling. So you know, that's an SLI down the bottom of the nesting in SL nesting. But just an example. So for the code SLO, we are already assuming well-formed HL7 records. So we can set this fairly high. Again, we're being clear about the transaction, the reaction and the source. Um, and it's often easy to set this goal too high. Remember, the goal is, um, you know, people say they want to, they like to say 100% for SLOs, but, but that means there will be no experimentation, no innovation, it, no risk taking. So it needs to be just over the level that will keep customers happy too high and opportunity costs. Opportunity costs are being wasted, okay? So for the code SLA, 
we need to apply an outcome. And note the SLA goal also allows some wiggle room with the SLO. We, we added a time range here now, and the SLA must be met over a sliding range of 28 days. The SLA should specify what happens when the SLA is missed. Does one department owe the other department a refund? You know, if it's a service provider relationship, it might be something like that of just like, just pay us some cash. But perhaps, you know, it, as the SLA is getting missed, something gets locked down. We don't allow changes for the next couple of weeks while we sort out all this nonsense. Or maybe the software release cycle gets automatically frozen for 28 days. It is good to agree those things uh, before you hit the heat of the moment that you're in the middle of something going wrong and you know your coders are like, yeah, I think I've got it. I think I can fix this immediately. Um, and But your nurses are still phoning up and going, the records are not in the record. What the hell is going on? So the SLA is, is the part that is negotiated. Now, in a perfect world, this is defined by the business or customer, but in reality, it is a conversation. Normally, I would not put technical phrases like well-formed HL7 in the SLA. It would be a customer outcome. But we'll come to that a little bit later in this session when I talk about negotiation. Okay, so you're going to have some SLIs and SLOs around code. Now, hopefully that gives developers a sense of balance, something to measure opportunities uh, to add features and innovate against, you know, clearing technical debt against business impact. Now, code runs on infrastructure, so that can have customer experience impacts as well. You have availability concerns of how to support updates to the infrastructure in the same way that you want to update your code. Updating operating systems, moving to different cloud or network providers, adding new locations to better support remote customers. These risks to availability and performance need to be balanced as well. So, <coughs> excuse me, this is our new dimension. As we add the infrastructure dimension, things get more complicated. You will be dealing with the full stack and often multiple stacks in multiple locations. In our hospitals, we had pretty much everything from Windows client applications to Unix labs and MQ systems and mainframe and systems. And they're all scattered across a state that is physically one third the size of mainland USA in Western Australia. And, and by the way, not close to any cloud providers. Um, so networks mattered. Some of the nested SLIs around infrastructure, they could be inherited SLIs from your cloud network or service providers. Like for code, you want to avoid silos of data here. It's best to have a single source of SLI truth for infrastructure. What you're looking for is the infrastructure's ability to support load and deliver predictable latency. Now, we need to include um, some more things here, the impact of all the infrastructure components into the SLIs, you know, so part of our nesting process. So we look at the total transaction time as a way of doing that. This would certainly have nested SLIs for each piece of the puzzle. And SLI for the labs update, leaving the lab hardware, and SLI for the message queue, adding and leaving. Remember that first one that we that I described in the start of this, this session? And SLI for the labs update, arriving in the patient record system, and SLI for traversing the networks. And SLI for adding it into the patient record, and you might even have an SLI for the database inserts on the patient record system. You can, you can get too crazy with SLIs. Um, so define SLIs at sort of system boundaries or team boundaries so that there can be a sense of ownership there. The strength of system boundaries is that they're less likely to change, um, but it might be too detailed. The strength of team boundaries is that you can assign responsibility more easily. Now, for SLOs, on infrastructure, you may want to express the SLOs in the shape of performance curves. Here, we expect the bulk to occur normally within 30 seconds, well within the technical capabilities of the infrastructure, right? It just needs to be enough to, the, to keep the customer happy. You don't want to you know, set it so high that you're overspending and, and under innovation, under innovative. So for example, where there's a high system load, you will see that we have a long tail here of about five minutes at the top of the curve. As we move to the SLA negotiated with the customer, you see a big jump. We're only committing to the five minute time for the, with them. And this came about after conversations with the ward nurses. And this is a key aspect of, of what I'm talking about here, that you know, we once we've worked out, after we've screwed up on, on the message queue and realized that we weren't, making the nurses happy. And nurses are very clear when they're unhappy, by the way. 
And we went out, I went out, you know, and talked to the nurses. I went out and watched what they did in the, in the wards and I went down to the lab systems to see what these people were actually doing so that we could build genuine measures for them of what they actually cared about. So we asked them about time and we expected them to be, you know, like most customers seeking instant response times. But their view was different. They know it takes time for the samples they take to be delivered physically from the wards to the labs. So they had a view of overall processing time. For them, the time frame was about beating the time it took a nurse to run from the ward to the NAT lab system when the system was down. Now that took about 10 minutes. So when we offered five minutes, they were happy. That was an important lesson. And, and it allowed us to avoid unnecessary infrastructure costs and other things. It, it doesn't always have to be as fast as possible, just as fast as necessary. And of course, when I worked for banks on stock trading systems, it was different. The processing time was a competitive differentiator for the traders. And as fast as possible, and never mind the cost, was the approach. The dimensions of code and infrastructure are, are not the full picture, however. So let's talk about the third dimension, the business and customer experience. And I saved the best for last. This third dimension is the business, or, or if you're a nonprofit or a government body, the customer experience. This is about the revenue and or service production capabilities of the application. As we add the business dimension, it can become difficult to measure the full experience. You will want to get out to the customer interface and, and that may require business integration or mobile platform agents. For availability and to track predictability of response times, you may want to add in synthetic testing tools into your environment. I'm going to keep it a little simpler for our hospital example and just talk about we're sort of just looking at the doctor and nurse experience. Now, we built and owned the patient record application, the mainframe piece. So we knew we could add in our own specific measure for that piece. And from observing the behaviours in the wards, we worked out that the nurses had an instinctive expectation of when the labs would come back. They would start looking at the record. If the update wasn't, you know, they'd open up the patient record and go, is the update there? And if they wasn't there, they would come back and try again in a few minutes. Repeated record lookups was our sign that we weren't meeting those instinctive expectations for the, for the people in the ward. And soon they would be calling us to complain. So we coded a repeat counter into our patient record application. Now, why did we set up beyond 10 seconds in there as part of the measure? Um, it, well, we had just, sorry, we had just within five minutes at first and then we hit a problem. We kept missing the target even when the records were processing fine. Um, you see, one or two of the nurses were, would not wait at all. They would just sit hit there hitting enter again and again and again. So we added the beyond 10 seconds as well as the sort of within five minutes to get around those sort of crazy impatient ones so that we weren't getting beaten up for their behavior. Um, now the SLO here is a little different as we want a low number or zero as the outcome. You might have expected a tiny percentage here, but the SLO includes all the malformed transactions coming out of that crappy lab system. So we needed to be realistic with them. In fact, this SLO sort of nests everything else in the system. And again, the SLA had reaction room against the SLO. So the eight hour time frame came from the nurses as they thought in terms of their shifts, that things, you know, they, what happens in the time that I'm here in the ward. So this three-way approach, we were really starting to work with the customer towards their success instead of managing towards a metric or a contract or a specific you know, tech piece of technology. Now, both parties were using the SLA as a tool instead of a cudgel to beat each other up with. So of course, there were many more SLIs and SLOs and SLAs in reality. You know, it's a, with a service provider, it's generally a fairly thick contract. But remember, my goal here with the examples wasn't to match reality, but to step you through the thought process. You need to consider all three dimensions for success. The SLAs are not there to beat each other up. They are there to capture the mutual understanding. You reach the mutual understanding through negotiation. SLIs, SLOs, SLAs, error budgets 
are the tools to support negotiation. Now, negotiating is a key skill for any SRE. Um, there are some great books out there, although they can be a little contradictory sometimes, getting to yes versus getting to no, and, and many are targeted sales for, uh, you know, and closing a deal. I'm personally, I'm a win-win negotiator. I want everybody to leave feeling like they won. That's not always possible. So here's a few quick thoughts based on my experience around negotiation. And I'll say it again, negotiating is a key skill in SRE. Um, you may think that you, know, you just need technology skills and know there's more to being an SRE than that. Now, know thyself is not a new idea. It was carved into the Temple of Apollo in Greece around the fifth century BC. Um, and knowing thyself is the best place to start. Consider your level of maturity as an SRE team and as an environment. How much can you control? What risk can you absorb and the business survive? And you kick your job. Is that risk spread evenly throughout the year or do you have peak periods like a Black Friday or a Super Bowl or a New Year's Eve? Are you in a period of significant transformation as an enterprise? Will things be the same in 12 months? or be so different as to make today's SOIs meaningless. Use all this to gather your needs. You probably have a feeling for what expectations the business will have, hopefully. Uh, what will you need to deliver that expectation? Could you accept tougher SLAs if you could grow your team or purchase supporting tools? Now, when consulting, I try and brainstorm this to identify where my outer boundaries are. What will be unacceptable or what will be too easy. Preparing to engage about, is about gathering information. So what you wanna do is build a strategic model from your information. There is a people factor here as well, so gather opinions about the people that you will be negotiating with. What are their goals? Their aptitude to risk versus innovation. Even subtle things like what time of day are they more open to ideas or in a better mood. Also, because you're gonna schedule your facilitations around that. Also identify a facilitator. This is, this is where you, um, it, if this is gonna be you, then read up and practice ahead of time. Facilitation is a very specific skill. Consider bringing someone in. You can bring in a contractor or a service partner who does this for a living. Um, facilitation is a skill. Or it can be great to bring in a leader from another part of the organization who you know is a natural facilitator, who can park their own ego and needs and draw input from everybody in the room or in the meeting. Um, and actually that can give that volunteer career profile within the company as well. Um, it'll let them see other sides of the customer company and the other sides of the company to see them. So it can be a win-win. Right? I said I like win-wins. Now it's time to schedule the meetings and get on with your negotiations. Um, the negotiating meeting has a general flow, right? You have your warm up and here you set the scope for the discussion, the application, the dimensions, the business value, and what they will get out of participating. Be brief, they're, they're all experts in some aspect here, so you, you don't wanna turn over every little stone yet, just get everybody to talk a little bit. Ask them to spend one or two minutes describing their aspect. The nominated facilitator should politely close down anybody who starts to exceed a brief introduction. And that's why it's good to have sort of an outsider that it doesn't create resentment in the room. It's just like people get controlled. Um, then you hit your test drive and that's where you present what some of the indicators could, under consideration at least, could be. Um, give one specific example of an SLI, an SLO, an SLA to clarify for them. Again, so in the same way that although pretty much everybody attending this conference would know the basics of SLA, 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 I took one slide to just step through to make sure that you and I were working off a common understanding of them. And you're testing the water when you do this in the negotiation. So try to make this something that could live on, you know, your example SLA, 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 that could live on in the final agreement. Something real. Now you want to assess, right? So you've test driven something with them. Now they have something to talk about and assess the business value. Is this the best place to start? Uh, will pursuing this scope give return on investment if you're a, you know, a, a revenue-based organization? Do you need to balance innovation and risk on this application? What actions will be effective for missed SLAs? Will you just freeze changes for a while to return to, st to stability? And if so, for how long? 
An important part of this phase is extracting and capturing assumptions. Clarifying assumptions is why footnotes on SLAs can sometimes be longer than the actual SLA. Um, and don't be surprised if you end up that way, that you know, the definitions and footnotes explaining things in the SLA is more detailed than the SLA. Then we reach the point of proposing. So now you have more information for everyone, you've updated your test drive, you can make a new proposal now. Now a few hints here. Predictability is often more important than speed. So the higher variance in response times, the more user experience is negatively affected. Um, if they know it's going to take, you know, 60 seconds every time, they can, I don't know, can you make a cup of tea or coffee in 60 seconds? Probably not, but, you know, they know that that's coming. But if it's most of the time taking 15 seconds and then but every once in a while taking five minutes, that's a negative experience. So avoid spreads that are greater than six standard de deviations of the metric, assuming you have the metrics tracked already. Um, greater than six standard deviations is an indication of low capability of process. It's not good. Um, and now you've proposed and you, you know, we discussed it. Now you recur. Now you assess the new proposal like you did for the test drive. You expect to iterate or recur through these stages as this is where the real negotiating occurs. You may need to schedule follow-up meetings. Now for each meeting, always take a few minutes to revisit the warm-up, restate the scope and goal, recap the conversations to date, and try to acknowledge something from each person during that warm-up piece. Again, during the warm-up, you're trying to get them in the room and feeling like they, you're feeling like they belong and that they are a participator because you want them participating and feeling respected. Then, of course, the wonderful thing, eventually you reach the agree. This is the final presentation of a finished SLA, SLA, or SLA for sign-off. It doesn't have to be a physical signature, but it is worth saying that you will need everyone to, as an example, you need everyone to confirm the email. They will need to commit on the record. If they're reluctant, it means you missed something. During the assess phase, return to that and try again. This is the process of the negotiating meeting or meetings. Sometimes you might, this might only take 10 minutes and sometimes it might take three or four meetings. Okay, so thanks for coming on that journey with me. Here's what I hope you take away from this session. Learn from my experience. Don't manage to the metrics, focus on the outcomes, the full transaction, the complete process, the overall experience. Don't use your service levels to beat each other up. Use them to become preemptive Use them so that you can offer more services uh, ahead of time. And when you build out your service levels, remember to assess them against the three dimensions. Are you seeing the full picture? Is there some critical aspect that's being overlooked? One of the most critical things uh, around customer experience that I have learned is predictability. With higher variance in response times, the more user experience is negatively affected. High variance is also an indicator, as I say, of low capability of process. So keep your eyes on the transactions that are outliers. Outliers annoy the crap out of us and they annoy the crap out of users as well. So finally realize that if you want to be great at SRE, you will need a negotiation skills. Negotiation is useful for life and it's useful for SRE. So as I promised, here are some links on reading on similar topics. Uh, so for those people who swap screens, this is the time to switch back to this screen and take a snapshot of the links here. You can catch up with most of my thoughts on my website. Um, and if you found the session interesting, then please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, I may have more interesting thoughts tomorrow. You never know. <laughs> um, so it might be worth a try. Uh, this is not my first time with the session, so I love feedback. Feedback would be great. So what caught your attention? What was important that I missed? Uh, because I'm sure there's something that I've left out. But with that, look, I want to thank Com42 and SREcon for hosting this session. I want to thank you for your time today. Um, and I will see you in the Discord channels. You can reach out to me there as well if you wish. Um, I hope you have the rest of the event and the rest of your day is fantastic.